Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. I hope people can now see and hear me okay. I apologize for the slight delay in beginning. We just had a stressful five or even eight minutes, but I do think we now resolved uh, the technical glitch that we had with WebEx here um, so that you can all see and hear me as well as our speaker. So welcome to this uh, second installment of what should be a longer series called uh, Pierre Dubois Lectures, Europe and the World, which um, invite prominent historians from Europe and beyond to speak about their ongoing or recently finished uh, research. In our first uh, installment, um, a couple of months ago, we had David Avram Bell. And today I'm very happy to present to you uh, someone who I who, who I've known for a while. Uh, his name is Kieran Patel. He holds the chair of European history at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Uh, and previous to that, he was uh, the chair uh, in European history at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And prior to that, uh, chair, I think, also of European history at the European University Institute. His position in Maastricht happened to be called the Jean Monnet Chair. And I think in uh, Florence at the European University Institute, I don't know if you had the Robert Schumann Chair, but certainly you were involved in the Robert Schumann Center. So basically, uh, the very names of his positions indicate to you already one of the specialties of his research, which has to do with the history of European integration, about which he will speak to us today. But his research portfolio and his interests are much broader than that. He's uh, written widely on German and American history, uh, in particular on the uh, Nazi labor service, as well as on New Deal America. So prior to the book that he will present to us today, his last book uh, was a global history of the New Deal. And in amazingly short succession, he uh, brought out another book, which was first published in German called Projekt Europa, Eine Kritische Geschichte, and was then translated into English. I think it came out uh, pretty recently uh, with Cambridge University Press entitled Project Europe, A History. So the critical from the German title was dropped. Uh, he may tell us a little bit more about the reasons of, of why that happened in the English uh, edition. But I'm very happy to welcome Kieran here to speak to us about uh, this book and about his research. It also fits nicely into the series and the designation and the purposes of the chair that I occupy here at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, which of course uh, should also be concerned with European history and um, in part with the history of European integration, which is an area that I can't represent very well. So I look um, forward to learning more about this from Kiran, as I have over the years. As I said earlier, we go back to a uh, time that we shared in Florence. And even though you can't be here physically for the reasons we all know, I very warmly welcome you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, and without further ado, I'll leave the floor to you, Kiran. Thanks. Excellent. Many thanks for the kind introduction, Michael, and also to the whole team at the Graduate Institute for bringing me to Geneva. Um, not physically, unfortunately, due to Corona, but again, I'm very happy and glad that I can be with you today and um, have this discussion on this new book that I published just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, put it here on screen for you on a set for a second on the history of the of European Union. So um, it was funny how Michael introduced me because um, my chair in Maastricht was also on European and global history, the one in Florence on transatlantic history. But in fact, the book that I'm talking about today is really on European history, the history of the European Union. There is some stuff on it that also tries to go global. And I'm also very happy to discuss why the critical went missing from the German to the English version. And this probably takes us right into the center of the book. I think that, again, the German word Kritisch has slightly different connotations than the English critical, hence it didn't really work, but the problem to which it points is one that we have across different languages. And I think it is a fundamental problem that many of us tend to have with the European Union, regardless of whether we like or hate it. And the problem is, as I would think, is that we tend to not find a real middle ground. Because I think that basically in academe, but also in the broader public, we only tend to have two versions of speaking about the European Union. 
On the one hand, again, seeing the European Union as a magic bullet, solving all our imminent problems, and hence we should finally bring it to full fruition. And alternatively, of course, there is public discourse according to which the EU is the worst thing possible, a bureaucratic and undemocratic juggernaut destabilizing our countries, economic, um, politically and culturally. And similarly, we might also wonder about the European Union's future, for which I also think there are two irreconcilable versions. On the one hand, seeing it on the verge of collapse, or again, weathering the storm pretty well. And if you will, and with this, I would like to go to my first slide. And I don't know if you can see this. So Michael, help me there, because my screen doesn't seem to work particularly well here. Try again, now it seems to work. Um, again, I think street artist Banksy's 2017 mural... Sorry, can't interrupt you there. We, we can't currently see the slides, so... Oh, we... gosh, okay. So what do we do now? Um, don't know. So you did see my starting screen, or not at all. Did you... Were you able to we see, see something? You. We see you speaking at the moment. Okay. So the presentation is nice, but I was fearing that there might be these technical problems. So if you can't see anything, um, I think it would easily take us another 20 minutes to sort it out as it did us before. Uh, thing. Then I will simply just go on talking because otherwise it might eat up too much time. So sorry about that. Um, don't know what we can do to sort this out. And I don't have anyone to assist me here while I speak. I'll just try this out one more time. Um, and yeah, so there it is. Now we see you sharing something. Right. Let's see. And my and presentation is on, so it should be somewhere. Can you see the presentation? Yes. But it's the last slide, so I'll go to the first slide and switch it on. So now we're on this slide with Banksy. Does that work? Yes, we see yes. the other okay. slides too, but it doesn't matter. So we, we, we can see it, yeah. You, you can see it? Yeah. Okay, so I think that street artist Banksy's 2017 and 17 mural can be read either in either way, either again as an image of the European Union in lethal crisis on the verge of being torn down. And this is what you see if you see this man hanging there and that star. Or you could also read it, and this is what you can see here, because the first picture was just a detail, on a man on a wobbly ladder uh, who is maybe more in danger kind of for falling down than of really destroying something very big and concrete. Hence, I think that um, Banks's mural is actually a rather good comment on our times. Now, what I'm trying to achieve with this book here is to contribute to a slightly more balanced picture of what the European Union is by analyzing its history, which of course I see as my job as a historian. And just to talk for one or two minutes about the state of the art so far, I would argue that historical research so far has mainly been interested in the politics of European integration, the negotiations, the motives, the interests, but we know stunningly little so far on its very effects. And this is again what the book tries to achieve by assessing several dimensions, particularly for the period of the Cold War, by raising questions such as whether European integration did really contribute to peace. And if it did really contribute to raising prosperity, if it was really about a community of values, as some argue, and how about the democratic deficit? The book all in all has eight chapters and each of them tackles one of these big, if you will, questions and tries to arrive at rather succinct answers as to the effects, again, this is the important word for me, effects of European integration for the lives of Europeans and many others. Hence, I'm trying to go beyond certain levels of myth makings from one side or the other. So this is meant with the word critical, not in the sense of negative, but certainly going beyond happy history on the one hand and polemics on the other. Now, in this short presentation, I can only give you one example, and I thought it might make sense to focus on the peace dimension as the one that is often most associated as a, with a success in the history of European integration. Again, with many of um, the protagonists and also supporters of the European Union arguing that this was the main achievement of European integration. If you, for instance, web visit the website of the European Commission's representations in Germany, it offers you a very succinct answer to the question of whether the EU has contributed to peace, because there you can read, for 70 years, the EU has been guaranteeing peace full stop. 
And it might not be a real surprise uh, that you do not find the same line on the commissions or the EU's representation in the United Kingdom, for instance, these days. But as we all know, many others are much more critical, including people like Boris Johnson, who's argued that only NATO at the international level was securing peace and the European Union did not play a role in this context at all. Now, what is my argument in this context in a nutshell? I would argue that the EU did contribute to peace, but later and in different forms than we have thought so far. And I want to run you through this with a quick uh, kind of session of arguments. First, I think we need to go back, in fact, to the level of motives and start probably with this man here, with Robert Schumann, the French foreign minister, with his 1950 um, Schumann declaration, with Jean Monnet as the main man behind that idea, an idea that certainly was about creating peace as one of the main motives. But here we need to bear in mind that there were also national interests at stake, particularly those of the French coal industry in this plan to pool French, German and other coal and steel sectors. So in order to make sure that Germany was not becoming too powerful. So in that sense, I think, yes, in the beginning, peace was sadly emotive, but yes, it also wasn't the most important one. And if we look at the effects, then we need to be careful, distinguish several dimensions, that if we just stay with this coal and steel community, which was set up in 1952, in the beginning, actually, it wasn't too important. Why? For several reasons. Firstly, this whole process of the European communities started too late with the early 1950s to really impact the early post-war Cold, Cold War order, that was well in place. So in that sense, it didn't have a systemic impact on what um, the European Union would become about. And secondly, also, and I hope you can see the next slide, that if you look at the most important conflict um, affecting Europe in the post-war era, which is certainly the Cold War, um, this first effort of European integration did more to split and um, increased the conflict between the various parts of Europe, particularly East and West, more than it helped to overcome it. And this caricature from Slovakia is a very good example. I could also give you sources such as the one from the Soviet Foreign Ministry in 1957, when the so-called Rome Treaties were set up, which argued that these treaties were further deepening the division of Europe and heightening the tensions within Europe. So in that sense, one can certainly argue that by uniting Western Europe along anti-communist and capitalist lines, European integration did more to actually create further tensions and split Europe as a whole than really overcome that. And now, if we then, as a next step, maybe take the Cold War as a given and look at what then European integration that eventually should lead to the EU of our days, and will also come to other dimensions later on, um, what it helped to unite the Western European camp, I would also argue that their effects were rather mixed. Because as you will probably remember, it wasn't all of Western Europe that was uniting here. You had this club of initially six countries, which then formed the EC, the European Communities, um, again with the coal and steel communities, and then these treaties of Rome here in blue. But you also, as early as 1960, had the outer seven, as they were called, the EFTA countries that were then forming a different kind of club, uniting most of the rest of Western Europe at the time. And hence, Western Europe was very much divided over various forms of European cooperation in the early post-war era. And it wasn't that this EC project was basically bringing all together. And there is another dimension that I think should be added to this equation, that if you again look at the level of effects, they should not be seen as too big, particularly for this coal and steel community. The idea was to create peace by pooling, again, two industries that were key for war production and war mongering. But again, the organization, this coal and steel community was becoming defunct within just a couple of years and didn't live up to the political and economic um, perspectives that were associated with it. And secondly, one could also go beyond that and say that certainly there were also in the early 1950s already discussions about bringing high politics fields together and turning them into fields of European integration, including security issues like the military, 
But with a 1954 effort to do something called a European defense community, these efforts failed, which then also made sure that in this field of security, the European communities did not become too important. So one could easily argue that in the early decades, there wasn't too much of piecework that should be associated with the European communities. But this is only part of the argument because so far I've basically used a very conventional security oriented um, definition of, of peace, which I think is important, but not the only one we should consider. For these early decades, I think other things need to be added to the equation. And I would argue that again, the European communities did in fact contribute to peace, mainly through other things. For instance, by creating a culture of compromise, uh, by bringing together politicians who stood at very different um, parts of the political spectrum so far, and turning them into negotiators who try to achieve something in common. And this picture might summarize that quite nicely. This is a picture of the first European um, Economic Community Commission formed in 1957-8. And what we see here, particularly if you just look at the three men um, with the red circles, is in the front, the man who smiles charmingly, Siko Mansholt, who was a Dutch uh, socialist, former resistance fighter during the Second World War. The man on the right hand side, German Walter Hallstein, a Wehrmacht officer during Second World War, and Lambert Schaus, finally from Luxembourg, who'd been in the resistance to some extent, but mainly also then a forced laborer um, under the Third Reich. And the point is that here you see these men just some 50 years, and of course it's only men at that time in these political kinds of organizations, trying to come up with a new European solution and working together. And I think that is the kind of soft policies compromises, orientation, um, and negotiation style that is certainly a contribution to peace at the time. And there is another dimension that we should not forget. And again, it's rather a different definition of peace that we need to bring in here. I would argue that the European community did contribute to social peace also very much, and very much so also by a project that is often seen very controversially, the Common Agricultural Policy of the EC, which is again a policy field that you can find highly problematic for a long range of reasons, from the ecological implications to the prices for taxpayers and so on, but the surplus production. But I would argue that it also helped to ease the transition of this primary sector into a different kind of world, a post-agricultural world, uh, whereby the subsidies paid by the European level was basically a form of welfare policy, which helped to ease the tensions that had been for turning parts of agriculture into a very radical field of policy making during the first half of the 20th century. Now, in the second half of the 20th century, and to a good extent also as an effect of the CAP, this EU policy, farmers were again angry and um, weren't happy about the policies they received. They took to the streets, but there was little political violence and radicalization. And in that sense, there was this contribution to social peace. Again, I want to emphasize that for projects like the CAP, there was a high price economically, politically, environmentally, but this hidden effect is something that we have tended to underestimate so far. And as a second dimension, as we move on into the second part of the Cold War, there was also something that was somewhat similar to this social peace dimension, i.e. that European integration tended to stabilize young democracies in a similar way as the creation of social peace in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, in the period of the 1970s and 80s. Interestingly, the idea that the EC was a community of value was very much also because these countries um, thought it was one and helped to turn it into one. So I do not want to argue that it was all about the EC, it was much more complex processes, but in the end, certainly, there was this economic dimension of stabilizing and contributing to social peace through enlargement and incorporating these countries. So uh, these processes of the 70s and 80s also gave the EU a lot of credentials at the end of the Cold War, when it then came to the transformation in Central and Eastern Europe, 
where again, I want to stress that forces of change did not come from the European communities or union, but rather from the societies themselves, like here in Gdansk in Poland in 1980, for instance. But certainly the European Union by then having turned into a platform that could also facilitate changes into a certain direction, also with its um, economic policies, was then seen as a force that could contribute at least short time a term to create social peace. So I would want to argue here that in this period, this is not very much about hard power forms of peace, but rather about this soft power kind of form of peace creation, which the EU contributed to at the time in the 1950s to 80s, that tends to be overlooked. Whereas in later periods, it also tried to could do more with the hard power. And this is an issue to which I will come back in a second. Now, one other argument that I want to do in my book is also to contextualize, to deprovincialize the history of this European Union a little bit further, also to go beyond the myth making that we often have, that basically what you had in this post war period was a situation whereby you had either nation states or the EU. Now, you are all aware that there were many other international fora at the time, also in Europe. I've already mentioned EFTA, the OECD could be mentioned, the Council of Europe, sub-organizations of the UN, like the UNECE could be added to the mix and many others. And what the book also tries to achieve is to critically understand why of all these organizations, it was eventually the European community that became so much more important than these other players. Again, all these other organizations continue to exist to this day, like the OECD, like the Council for Europe, like the UNECE, and so on, but they have turned into much less powerful entities. And again, the argument is not so much whether this is good or bad, but rather to historically understand why this was the case. And to be honest, I was myself um, surprised to see how little research we have on this issue so far. So if you look into this, sorry, now there is a problem with the presentation. And I, I think I'll just leave the presentation here and talk about the arguments a little bit more um, directly this way. Um, I have three arguments that I want to highlight why the European communities became such an important player here. The first one is to argue that it was very different because it had this economic DNA, particularly through the economic um, community created in 1957, whereby you had a logic that you could argue, well, we are trying to create a common market. And with from this common market, it's easy to think about spillovers into other policy fields. Um, so the point is that you had, for instance, the common market, but then the question easily arose on whether one should also go beyond that and create new rules for transport or about the environmental implications of these policies and so on. Now, there is a theory called neofunctionalism that has tried to explain these kind of spillovers from one policy field to the other. This is not my argument that you had that necessarily from one field to the other. But what you had is an incremental process where time and again, actually, policy actors in the Commission, in the European Parliament elsewhere, were working along these lines and making these spillovers happen. And if you just compare this to the Council of Europe, which was in charge of much more high kind of politics issues like human rights, such spillovers were much more controversial. And the member states as the main gatekeepers of power expansions and competence creep were quite hesitant to allow for that. So this economic dimension, I argue, played an important role why you had over time from the 1950s onwards, this incremental expansion of, of competencies by the European community in comparison to other institutions. The second argument, and again, apologies for the PowerPoint not, not, not working anymore, is that the EC, EU also had its own monies to a much larger extent than the other organizations. The details are quite complex and would take us to the 1950s and to the 1970s and many moments of decision making. In a nutshell, the point is that in comparison to all these other international organizations, the EC had rather substantial own means that it also could then spend on issues more at its own discretion than other international organizations, which often only had monies for their secretariat, what in the EC jargon would be the European Commission, but very little else. 
So if you look at the document from the Council of Europe, for instance, you have a constant complaint about not being able to really fund the fantastic projects that people were, in the, were able to think of in the administration. Whereas in the European community from the 70s onwards particularly, you had these means, which also led to cooperation with other international organizations, including the Council of Europe, which then often had the ideas, the um, knowledge and so on, whereas the European community came in with the money and over time often also almost hijacked or selectively adapted, I could also say, some of the policies first developed in other international organizations. And to keep this brief, we started slightly late, but I want to also conclude so basically on time. There is a third argument that I would like to make, and that has to do with the legal muscle of the European community and union in comparison to other international organizations. So what you have in the European community is a legal order with a at least supranational dimension, i.e. that in a nutshell, you can create legal regulations that would supersede national lawmaking. And this is different to a regulation international organization is different to the law of the OECD, of uh, the Council of Europe and all these other organizations. And over time, you had also this tendency to, again, activate that legal muscle more and more that also in their choices, member states that often, again, were members of all these organizations, were seeing the advantages of going further in this lawmaking. To give you one or two examples there, Yet, for instance, in the 1970s, um, the invention of environmental policy making as a new international policy field. And it was first discussed in a whole range of international organizations in the OECD, in NATO even, but also in the Council of Europe and the European community. And it wasn't clear which, if any, of these forums would eventually become an international player of any weight in discussing environmental issues. Now, what you have over time, and that has to do with the bigger um, weight of its law, the European community becoming the main player. If you now sit in a member state of the European Union, and if you want to teach national environmental um, law, as a law teacher, for instance, at a university, your life will be short, or at least your class will be short, because there is so much that is European by now that, again, the European Union is the main player at that level. And that is a process that is only some 40 years old and for which this legal dimension that I was mentioning a second ago has a very important role. So, in a nutshell, I try to also here denaturalize, if you will, the rise of the European communities to becoming a very important international platform um, from the 1950s into the end, into the later periods of the Cold War, by seeing the specific reasons that help us to explain how this rise was possible, by not seeing it as something that was a given, which for me was not the case, and by bringing in a kind of the historical expertise on the effects of integration over time. Now, this is basically what I probably can share with you in half an hour. Um, again, I want to underline that the idea is to discuss and bust some of the myths about the European Union. Um, again, want to summarize the argument that I made about peace just one more time here. Again, the argument was that it was contributing to peace, but later and in different ways than so far. I imagine that some of you at the Graduate Institute might also be more interested in policy implications than in basic research only. So let me also think this through for you for a second, what then the implication of such a historical finding could be. And I want to again mention that for the other issues in this book, I also try to go beyond the historical analysis only. Now, the argument for me would be that if you take this as a starting point, that the EU's contribution to peace was more in the field of social peace than of security in the heart um, kind of uh, military sense. And then the argument would be that, therefore, one should also see more recent developments, like, for instance, in the 2010s with the association agreement around Ukraine and also other talk in the European Union of becoming a military force in this historical perspective to argue that, again, in such a dimension, the history of the European Union is very young, that it doesn't have a lot of very positive track record in creating those kinds of military capabilities, whereas, again, on the social front, it did actually did contribute to stabilizing European societies at some time.
Now, also, if you want to turn the second part of the argument slightly more critically, the argument would also be that during the Cold War, with policy instruments as the common agricultural policy, the European communities did actually contribute to social peace. But the pressing issue from the perspective of 2020 would certainly be what kind of programs the EU has today to help those who are not the winners of processes such as globalization and digitalization, or also those who are now suffering more than uh, many others from the corona crisis. So in that sense, also that social dimension, I would argue, raises questions about today by looking back into the past. And again, I only had some 30 minutes to talk about the book and some of the findings, but I'm very happy to also come back to other dimensions or discuss the issues that I've um, summarized for you briefly in more detail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kieran, for this uh, tour de force and time and I apologize for putting the owners on you to to do this in 30 minutes because there's so much to the book so much more to the book of course than, than you can summarize in 30 minutes and you didn't even uh, fulfill all of your 30 minutes I'm grateful for that which means we have much more uh, time to 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 talk about this as as you were speaking I, I found myself thinking of uh, which adjective could have taken the German kritisch in the English translation one is myth busting you eventually mentioned it yourself you can't call it a myth busting history even though it is <laughs> i suppose on, on 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 many levels another adjective that that came to my mind is it seems also to me that it is a cautious history you can't call it a cautious history because that will cannibalize sales probably um but it is a cautious history in the in the in, in the positive sense um which basically seems to me to lower the bar a little bit for measuring the success and failure of of the european union so by saying that um actually the history of the european union didn't exactly conform to what its own myth propagates you are also saying well if that is true then not everything will immediately look like a failure because you don't set the bar so high right um if if we kind of break up the, the the many little things that it did uh then crises such as the one that we are experiencing today uh don't perhaps look so insurmountable as they as they would if we believed the entire myth um all right i'll, I'll leave it there i already see several questions in the chat uh the way this worked last time and ideally should work this time is that you basically type in your questions into the chat uh, which i will then read to uh kieran patel who will try to answer them one by one we still have quite a bit of time so at the moment i suggest we do this one question at a time if they then accumulate i i might throw you three or more at once let's let's see how it's going so at the moment we have uh, one question from our participants uh, by richard hill who asks if you could elaborate a little bit more on whether you think that the EU has brought peace outside the Union. So, for example, in the Balkans, in the Middle East or in Africa. Excellent question. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, if I may call you Richard. Um, I think there the balance sheet is also quite mixed. And if I may start with um, the 1990s and ex-Jugoslavia, um, some of you might remember that the Luxembourg foreign minister of the time, a man by the name of Jack Paul, said that this would be finally Europe's hour, that basically um, in this part of the European continent, the European Union would now be in charge. And we'll probably all remember that if we walk through the the wars then of the 1990s, the European community was actually not, or the European Union by then, I should say, was actually not the force that was able to bring about peace, that NATO and very much also the United States was the main player in that context. So I would argue that again, there the European Union did, had not by then built up the capabilities to really bring about that form of peace in the security sense. And if we look beyond Europe, also there the balance sheets tends to be rather mixed. So the ACP countries and the whole regime and system of creating links to former colonies and countries in the global south has, of course, had economic inf influences and an impact, but also there isn't a very clear peace dimension to that. 
Um, an interesting episode in this, and again, there is not one quick way to summarize this because each and every instance would have to be considered carefully, is actually the Falkland Wars, um, again, of the early 1980s, where um, you had the conflict between the United Kingdom and Argentine over the Falkland Islands. The interesting thing is that the European Union at the time took sides with the United Kingdom and also went for sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Argentine, which one can see as a way of acting together. And I do not want to argue that this is a force of peace in a clear-cut sense, but that the European Union at the time was trying to also impact questions of war and peace by again taking sides in, in a clear-cut way, um, which I would also find as a rather single-sided and not very convincing way, particularly if you look at how the whole trajectory then turned out. But when it comes to big questions such as ending the Cold War, um, one can certainly say that by looking back from the perspective of today into the 1980s and 90s, what European integration contributed to, not was mine mainly or only it's responsible of, was trying to decouple couple some inner European dynamics from the superpower Cold War dynamics that had unleashed again in the early 1980s. As you will remember, there was a new kind of um, level of tensions um, in the early 1980s and through its economic policies particularly, um, the European communities was actually decoupling from some of the power dynamics between the Soviet Union and the, um, so, and the United States. So in that sense, I would argue in a nutshell that the overall balance sheet is quite mixed when it comes to creating peace outside of uh, Europe itself and the Union itself. Um, it's particularly in a mix when it comes to dimensions where military power would have been involved, because this is not where the whole process started. This is not where the capacities, the powers, the um, competences of the Union lie also today. And I would also think that for this reason, the European Union should be thinking quite carefully when actually to put itself into a position to say, well, it can be a force of peace, um, which then often actually has not really worked out particularly well. Um, this, again, is a rather broad brushed answer, and we could have many um, examples where the balance sheets might be slightly worse even or slightly better, but this is the overall direction my argument would be going. Thank you, Kiran. I have two questions uh, from two participants, which I take to be almost the same and thus conflate into one. Uh, if the question writers disagree, you might as well specify in the chat. So, uh, Rui, Rui Marques Pinto and Graham Avery both ask a question about uh, Brexit. Uh, one asks, how, how do you situate uh, Brexit within the history of the European Union? The, the other one asks more specifically whether your history of the European Union nuances uh, our understanding of Brexit. Thank you again to both of you for the questions, uh, particularly hi to Graham. It's nice to, to not see you, but know that you're there. Again, we also spent some time in Florence together. I do um, think that my book sheds new light on Brexit. Why and how? Um, I argue in the book that disintegration is less new than we tend to think. And I give two historical instances and um, analyze them in quite some detail to also think where Brexit is and what it means for the European Union today. What do I mean with this precisely? On the one hand, I discussed the case of Algeria, 1962. On the other hand, of Greenland, 1985. Two countries that had not joined, just to be very clear, the process of European integration as full-fledged member states, with both of them as part of imperial constellations on the one hand, Algeria being part of France and the French Empire, if you will. Um, on the other hand, um, Greenland then as part of Denmark, but both of them deciding um, at some point to to change their relations to the European communities at the time. Um, in Algeria's case, very clearly as part of the War of Independence, the bloody War of Independence, and at that end, in 1962, arguing that while also decoupling from France and again becoming independent, one wanted to also 
be kind of ch um, um, change, uh, get rid of the links to the European community. And the same, uh, something somewhat similar happened in Greenland in 1985 after referendum in 1982, where the country changed its status from being a member or direct part of the European community to only becoming associated member. Now, the argument in a nutshell here is, and this I think can be shown with both of these cases, that Again, firstly, these episodes have basically been forgotten. So also, if you look into most history books, they're never mentioned. And that might explain some of the discussion that we had about Brexit, that this is the first time that we have a case where countries want to leave. Now, of course, the United Kingdom is not the same as the two cases I've mentioned. It's a full-fledged member state. It's a very big and powerful member state. But I think there is still something to be learned there. Because what both these countries have in common is that immediately after leaving, there was a new discussion going on. So in Algeria's case, it's very interesting because what you had in a nutshell is a process from a very soft exit, I would then call it, to a hard exit over time. And in Greenland's case, the other way around. Um, what do I mean with this? Um, again, when Algeria left in 62, it also, Ben Bella as president, wrote a letter to Halstein as commission president, and I have all the details in the book there, um, that one wanted to leave the relationship intact as if there was no change. So it was basically an act of window dressing to go for kind of decoupling from the European communities. And this was mainly for economic reasons. And this went on for some time, even if, if it must have put kind of um, uh, lawyers in the European community into a horrible situation, while in only 10 years later with the um, protectionism of the EC in agriculture hardening, um, the situation was then turning into a very harsh situation for Algerian wine growers particularly, which again led from a very soft exit and basically a continuation of the status quo to a very different kind of situation. And in Greenland's case, it's very interesting because basically by tendency it's been going the other way around, that in the 1980s, and there the talk is so fantastically similar to sovereignty talk in Britain in the Brexit context, you had a situation where one wanted to get rid of the European communities and stay with Denmark. And what you now have, or in the meantime, had for some time, particularly in the 2000s in Greenland, was a situation where the people there wanted to decouple more from um, Denmark, but wanted to get closer to the European Union again. So the argument in a nutshell for Brexit is, and I think this is exactly what we've already seen over these past four years since 2016, that there isn't a clear cut solution once and for all. And let's remember that this was also what David Cameron promised with the referendum, that the referendum would bring clarity forever what the relationship of the United Kingdom to the European Union would be. What we've seen over the past four years is a very messy process in which positions and also the relationship has already changed quite several times. And I would argue that also after January 2021, um, the process will not come to an end and there will be certainly new and next rounds and and I think that is the similarity that we see from the perspective of the overall process. When it comes to the European Union, again, the interesting finding is that on the one hand, um, this integration is not new. And the other thing is that it takes real history research to bring that up because there was also so much interest in the European Union to sideline and make these processes being forgotten that again, make again this Brexit um, period that we're living in at these days so look so, so new, while in fact it isn't as new as it's often being described. Thank, Thank you. you. I have quite a few more questions here. Um, maybe just to say two things. First of all, there's no need to write to me privately, although you can. Uh, but if you don't write to me privately, not everybody will see your question. It, it, it will only be for us here to see it. So there, there's no need to write to me privately. And secondly, it would be good if you could write uh, full sentences. I, I, I get a few uh, you know, uh, catchphrases thrown here, which I s sometimes struggle to translate into a full question. Um, but let's let's begin with the next one, which is uh, from uh, Caroline de Gruyter, who writes, I liked your book a lot, but one thing I missed was German-French reconciliation. Isn't this also what peace was about? 
Um, thank you very much also for the compliment for the book. Um, I do actually write about reconciliation in the this chapter on peace briefly, and probably you're right that I should have spent slightly more space on it. My argument on reconciliation, particularly Franco-German, is that the European communities at the time were only one force among several others in this context, and that reconciliation between these two countries was not hinging on and dependent on the European communities only. So what you had at the time was also city partnering, for instance, jumelage and all these kind of processes, which institutionally were not linked to um, the institutional level of the European communities. Um, you had um, also the bilateral level of uh, negotiations and, um, and contacts and issues. So I would argue that on these issues of reconciliation, what you have is the European community very often and soon turning into a symbol for processes that were often much more complex and multifaceted that involved also very different layers of actors and different forms of interaction but it would be wrong to all kind of summarize them under the umbrella of the european community if you look at concrete effects and the fact that, again, we tend to associate them with European integration is still quite revealing. I also have these pictures that some of you might be familiar with um, of, for instance, um, there is these two fantastic images that are quite well known, and I'll show them in the book, maybe that will work, of Adenauer and de Gaulle in Rhin, in the Rhin Cathedral, and of Mitterrand and Kohl in Verdun in 1962 and 84, respectively. Now, these are bilateral events of reconciliation, and it is interesting that they were immediately also fed into the rhetoric of the EC and European integration, If again, even if the causality is not so easy. Hence, also there, I try to complicate the picture a little bit. Um, while I do not want to argue that um, the EC did not play any role for reconciliation between these two countries. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Helmut Brandt, who asks how you see the chances of a European health union in the light of COVID. Right. Um, a great question and a difficult one, honestly, one about which I've also thought quite a bit recently, again, in light of COVID. Um, the standard answer would be that probably the opinion today doesn't have any powers in health and probably this will never happen. Now, I started to look into this slightly more carefully and what I've seen is that again, particularly since the 1990s, but also with starting points also in the 1970s already, the European community started to develop elements of a health policy which have remained very patchy, but where early episodes of pandemics actually were always instrumental of giving incrementally more powers to the European Union. Now, what I would think I could add as a historian to the conversation is also to bring up a counterfactual. Now, imagine just for one second, COVID had happened in 1980, for instance. I would argue that nobody on this planet would have thought that the European community of the time would have been a major force to deal with either the health crisis itself or then its economic consequences. Now, what we have today is that the European community is making efforts while we speak every single day with small steps to also at the very health dimension of this, come up with solutions and coordinate the efforts of member states. Um, this traffic light system, for instance, of travel options within member states is very incomplete, but is something, one of the most recent steps of European integration, where the European Union through coordination is trying to make efforts in this field. And the whole bigger package, the July compromise between the heads of states and governments of these billions of euros as a recovery um, package to overcome the economic um, implications of Corona, I think are some th the elements that would have been inconceivable some 30 years ago that the European community would have been thought of as an actor of that kind. Again, 30 years ago, probably people would have thought, if at all, at the member at the nation states, maybe at the World Health Organization, but little else. So as a historian and maybe trying to historicize our own times already a little bit before we can do so properly in some decades from now, I would argue that we see an interesting, a very fascinating transformation going on in which the level of expectation associated with the European Union in 
also fighting the crisis is unique and would have been unthinkable only a few decades ago. And that in itself is already remarkable. And secondly, that we do see an increasing effort by the institutions to also make the European Union's work as an instrument fighting the crisis. So my argument is that the level of expectations has changed fundamentally. And of course, I and probably all of us do not know how the crisis will unfold in future, how it will go on and when it will hopefully soon end. But it will be very important on how the next, what the next months will bring, whether the instruments set up by the European Union will bring some success or not, and how the health dimension of European integration will develop further. Again, if this story can be told as a success story, say in 10, 15 years time, then probably one will see this as an important starting point, though the historian me would argue that there is a history that already goes to the 70s and 90s as a starting point for these developments. Thank you. Next question is from Ryan Glauser, who asks, what are some of the drawbacks of describing the European Union and European integration in terms of peace and security? Or in other words, why not use stability to describe the evolution of the EU? Very good question. I um, The book kind of tries to bring up and also then discuss the topics that are normally associated with the European Union. So in that sense, I was trying to think of some of the stereotypical descriptions of the European Union, where this peace narrative, I would argue, is too big to ignore. But I would agree with you that stability, depending, of course, on how you define stability, can be analytically a much more interesting concept than security or maybe even peace. Again, this is what I probably try to describe by using the term of social peace as a form of stability. And I would also want to stress that this was always fragile and incomplete. So there is nothing that turns this into a full-fledged success story there. And categories like success and failure are very problematic from a historian's perspective anyway. Let me also add that the point is that also there, the idea that the book has is to deconstruct some of the myths and trying to come up with a nuanced and more balanced interpretation of the past that then again arrives at these different conclusions. Um, one other example that I can give maybe to also change topics a little bit and talk about other parts of the book in the part about e the economy. I also try to talk about um, the growth paradigm that very much um, informed European integration and the idea of prosperity and how that in itself as a category is a construction at the international level that can also be historicized that the idea to link um, the success of an international forum such as the European community to GDP growth, for instance, is not a given, but is a historical, the, the result of a historical process with antecedents in the interwar years, and then also very important role by the United States, but other international organizations such as the OECD that came to create this nexus and also the very language that we tend to use. So in that sense, the book also tries to be very sensitive of the language that we use, because often this language, the language of peace, of security, of prosperity, is the language of our sources. And my um, argument would always be that as historians, as proper and as scholars, we need to be careful in importing these source terms and concepts into our analytical frameworks, because again, they come with their own biases and the job is also to be critically aware of the implications that these terms have. So I'm very much um, agree with you and I'm grateful for the question. Okay, so the next question is from uh, Paulette Beres will which relates to the ideological templates behind the idea of a European Union. And in particular, uh, asks you whether you see any relationship to earlier ideas of Simon Bolivar and the Congress of Panama in early 19th century Latin America. <laughs> 
A very good question, and I would argue that there are some links to these earlier, also 19th century, also um, Pan American ideas, um, not only Simon Bolivar and um, kind of this specific Congress, but also many others. Um, my argument comes in several parts, if you will. On the one hand, I would argue, yes, that these elements do exist and maybe give you um, one concrete example of continuities in this context. Um, some of you might be aware of a man by the name of Richard Kudenhove Kalergi, one of the most important protagonists and um, kind of supporters of European integration in the 1920s and 30s, the man who founded the pan European um, organization at the time, which was a, um, um, a lobbying group for pro European matters. Now, the point is, if you read his book published in 1923, Pan Europe, carefully, what you will see is that his template really for creating a form of pan European Union, as you would call it, was really Pan America. So, in that sense, what he perceived as a much more intense form of cooperation in the Americas, actually, was for him a role model for then coming up with um, a new form of integration in Europe. The interesting point is also that, of course, his views of what Pan-Americanism was about was somewhat kind of distorted, and what he wanted was also not a sheer replication of Pan-Americanism, but it's certainly the case that there was a rhetoric of also looking beyond, of activating a rhetoric that was used elsewhere to make a case for European integration. The second dimension of the argument that I would also like to make um, might sound um, like the very opposite of the first. Now, I would want to argue that basically one should not overemphasize these kind of continuities to pre-1945 history, actually. My argument is that prior to 1945, an idea of unifying Europe along these capitalist, anti-communist, um, democratic um, lines was an option that certainly did exist and where there had been kind of thinkers discussing these kind of ideas for quite some time. But until really 1945, and to a slightly lesser extent into the 1920s, this was a very marginal position that it took very much the post Cold War, the post 45, the Cold War constellation to turn this discussion and this very marginal option into one that could become plausible and then also possible for political actors and also activists. So in that sense, it's often more productive to look back from the discussions of say the 1920s and the 30s, but then particularly the 40s and 50s, and see how actors then try to look back and also think about history as a potentially for them useful past and think which actors they could mobilize for their own new specific interests. Um, give you a couple of examples. For instance, Hugo Grotius or William Penn or other thinkers who in many textbooks today are seen as the kind of founding fathers of the idea of a united Europe were then often only rediscovered with these specific writings um, in the 1920s and 30s, where the League of Nations actually in Geneva was an important place where um, new editions of these texts were created, which then served as a, as a hub, as a think tank, as a laboratory for thinking about new forms of European integration, also into the post-45 era, and were then rediscovered to a good extent. So there is no direct line, I would argue, for instance, from William Penn and his ideas around 1700 about creating a European diet or parliament, as he called it, um, to then the European Parliament today. But it is interesting that from the 1920s, there was a renewed interest in Penn and his writings that then is um, leading us to kind of more recent developments and again is also look back into early modern history. And something similar in a nutshell, I think, could also be said about um, Bolivar and um, kind of Pan-Americanism more generally, even if there, again, as so often also on other issues, this remained an expert discussion. And a good part of the argument about the European Union post-45 was also to argue that this is brand new, that, of course, culturally, you had always been united, which I think is also problematic essentializing argument, but that institutionally this was all new and new research has shown that also institutionally there is a long and very thick layer also of continuities from the League of Nations, from experiences with supranationality, 
in very technical institutional fora, such as the commission that was organizing navigation on the Rhine in the early 1900s and so on. So that also there, and this is basically the third argument of continuities from these more technocratic international solutions and organizations, one should also see continuities feeding into the post-45 period that makes this story of longer lines leading then into this process all the more interesting uh, but also much more complex than we have long thought i would think thank you i have two more questions so i won't put them together but uh, have them one one after the other the first one uh looks straightforward but maybe it's a trick question uh, it's from Stella Gervas, who also thanks you for your masterful presentation. And uh, you should probably answer her question thinking that Josep Borrell is in the room or something like that. Uh, <laughs> what should the EU do in order to be a more credible international actor next to Russia, China and the US? First of all, thank you for the compliment. I'm glad that Josep is not there, again, as my former boss at the UI. Um, again, no easy answer possible. I think, again, to some extent, being more realistic about what the European Union can actually achieve and what it is would be a good step forward. And to talk about a community of values, for instance, is one issue where the European Union should also be quite careful. There is a chapter on this in the book. Um, again, I think today we often have this talk that the challenge to the value dimension in European integration is something new and basically posed by countries like Poland or Hungary. Now, the book also shows that already in the 1960s, this is very much up for discussion. And when, for instance, in the early 60s, Spain tried to forge closer relations to the European communities, be it as an associate country, maybe even as a member, the German and the French foreign ministry had little problem with that, that it took the European Parliament and also other activists to then remind the institutions that, well, you don't want to necessarily become too closely associated with French dictatorship. But we want to be different to other international organizations where, um, again, authoritarian dictatorial regimes were in fact member. And hence, that's basically this rhetoric of um, being a community of value is also more fragile than we've tended to think. So looking back, and this is the job of the historian, I think looking back, we have to be slightly more careful with some of the often held assumptions as to what the European Union can actually do. And a good quantum of modesty would probably be quite good, also in light of the mixed balance sheet in the past, something I think I've mentioned also in some of the other issues before. And secondly, I would think that if we just continue talking about the value dimension for another second, then of course you can only be credible if you're credible, i.e. that then one also needs to live up to one own standards. And this is certainly not what the European Union is doing all the time. Now, the migration crisis only being one of the most obvious examples uh, where there is a very big tension between what the European Union wants to do and what it again um, what it is, and again, uh, the role of kind of securing um, the rule of law and democracy within is also certainly a very um, challenge where it has a very mixed balance sheet. And we're also there again, being a critical international actor is quite difficult if you haven't really sorted out the problems that you have internally. This was particularly true with regards to countries in the global south, I would argue. And where we also, and this is maybe just one way of ending answering this question, need to be aware of the fact that when the European institutional process began, it wasn't really starting as a post-colonial project, i.e. as a process that started post um, decolonization and as a reaction to Europe's lost uh, um, kind of power in the world. But rather, my argument is that it started as a as a very late colonial project with all the problematic implications this implies, which also implies that again, rare at playing a level of uh, playing a role at the international level, the early balance sheet of the European Union is actually quite mixed. And this is probably also again easily forgotten in Brussels in Berlin and in other European capitals, but less so in some of the capitals and also the countrysides of the global south. So also there, thinking about one's own past and being more realistic about what can be achieved in light also of the past and the capabilities that the EU have, I think would be a very good starting point.
All right, thank you. And then I have a final question from Grace Baller, who also thanks you for the presentation and who asks, if the social programs implemented by the EC or the EU contributed to peace and social cohesion in the 20th century, can we then understand 21st century Euroscepticism as a product of the EU's failures to respond sufficiently to issues of inequality and the challenge of globalization? A very good and question. Yes. And I would argue that. Not there... question, hang on. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry yeah. uh, do any recently developed social programs promise a remedy on the scale of the early social programs in the 1950s and 60s? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Michael. Um, yeah, I think that's a very good question. The one million dollar question to some extent. I honestly am not a great fan of um, kind of answers that put the blame all on one front and one organization, if you will. I think that the rise of populist and neo-nationalist forces has many different sources, many of them, of them also at the national level. So in that sense, um, the fact that the EU also is um, now um, exposed to much more Europe skeptical position has many different sources also going beyond uh, what is going on in EU politics. But I do agree with you that there is a link to that. And I would also agree that the policies of the European Union that we've seen in more recent decades do provide rather little direct help to people who are then basically suffering much more from the detrimental um, effects of processes such as globalization or digitalization. Um, I want to argue that the European Union in some ways can be seen more as a platform than as an ideologically or philosophically consistent project. Um, hence, it has been moving into very different directions, from more Keynesian policies to more neoliberal policies, from protectionism to liberalization, and often it's been doing all these things at the same time, also across its different policy fields. But I would want to argue that since the 1990s, particularly, and with starting points, particularly in the second half of the 1980s, a more liberal, including more neoliberal policy approach has been gaining momentum in the European Union, um, following up ideas that the European Union communities were already developing in the 1950s and 60s with a specific model of welfare. And the model was not through redistribution like you would have in classical social policy, but rather with the idea that you want to generate growth um, through opening of markets, through liberalization, and that that model would help everybody, basically. Now, there were these sideshows and important ones, such as the Common Agricultural Policy, as compensation to these policies. And they were also developed more recently in the 1990s and 2000s. But I think the thrust of the policymaking um, in the European Union has going more and more into this more liberal and neoliberal policymaking, whereby these other mechanisms that would help people more directly have been losing out. You can already see this in the negotiations around the Maastricht Treaty, where Delors, as Commission President, his ideas of a social Europe were not becoming very powerful in the aftermath. And I think that also here, the most recent developments are very interesting. Uh, the mechanism with which the EU has reacted to the 2008-9 Eurozone crisis is very much austerity. But I think that also now with uh, Corona and the effects on European community, uh, the economies, some of the mechanisms that we see being discussed such as the ideas of helping young unemployed people particularly would lead into a new direction. Now, we probably all know that um, these decisions haven't been fully taken yet, that um, the European Parliament still has a say in this and they haven't been fully implemented. We also don't know what Corona will continue to do with us in how far policy instruments can have a real sustained effect. But I think this could lead potentially to a slightly different direction beyond the austerity policies that we've seen over the past 10 years. So there is an inroad into a different kind of policy making that has a slightly more distribution oriented um, direction and that could again replicate the kind of role with creation of social peace that the European integration process played in the Cold War. But I only see early beginnings of this and not a full fledged 
policy orientation in this direction. So it will be remain very important to see how this goes. And I see this as a, as I was mentioning before, as a real problem that the European Union doesn't develop further into this direction, because I feel that it does actually, as you were asking, contribute to the rise of neo-nationalist and populist um, political parties and arguments. All right, so um, I have two more questions here. And so, Kiran, you, you brought this upon yourself by being so good with the timekeeping earlier that I that I throw two final ones at you and, and then give you a break. The first one is from Emmanuel Comte, who also thanks you for the presentation and who asks, what is your view on the factors explaining the nonviolent outcome of the agricultural question and the stabilizing effects on Mediterranean democracies. And then here's a final one again from Richard Hill, who asks you if you would agree that the EU positions in trade negotiations, in particular in relation to the WTO, regarding agriculture and intellectual property, are still largely colonialist. Wow, two big ones to, to end this with. Okay, thank you, first of all, Emmanuel. Nice to not see you, but get a question from you. Again, this doesn't, uh, the screen functions don't allow to have visuals of the participants. Um, again, there is no easy answer to explain the non-violent outcome um, of the common agriculture policy as it was installed in the 1950s and 60s. But I would argue that, um, and I have done detailed research, particularly for the German side, what you see is that the money's put into the sector help to also channel and funnel some of the dynamics and the critical energy amongst farmers into new directions. For those less familiar with the field, let me just remind you again, this is a period of radical transformation. In the 1950s, 60s, you had many Western European societies where agriculture was basically keeping 30 to 40% of the population in busy in the labor force. And we now have a situation where often it's only 1% of the labor force that is in agriculture. So you have a radical transformation of the sector. And you do have, again, people finding jobs, particularly doing what we now tend to call the trente lorieurs, these 30 years of post-war boom, post-45 in other industries but many of them also clinging to their life on the land and to identities that were also often formed over generations. And I would want to argue that the European um, agriculture policy was basically an instrument which did not have a master plan, did not follow a clear cut ideological line. And hence the social policy dimension was also always hidden and not made very explicit. But the point that it did do was actually the following, that it actually slowed down the transformation of the agriculture sector, because on the one hand, national political ag um, agriculture policies were not able to deliver anymore. They would have collapsed probably because of the financial financial burden they would have put on countries like the Netherlands and France. And hence, they provided help for farmers through subsidies and protectionism, if you will, particularly to, again, exist in farming, but also that many realized that this could not go on forever. So in that sense, it slowed down and it smoothened the transition of many people who were coming from agricultural backgrounds into new professions and jobs over these decades, particularly from the 1950s into the 1980s. And again, this, I think, helped to also dampen the um, conflict potential in the field, because what you also had is that farmers union, such as the FNSEA in France or the DBV in Germany, were very much part and integrated in the policymaking, had a big say on national administrations as they were contributing to EU policymaking. And hence, there was basically a double bind. On the one hand, what you often had is that agricultural policies for the EC, but also the national level was very much defined in these lobbying groups. And hence, there was a direct influence, which also explains why these policies were often rather problematic from perspectives of those such as taxpayers or consumers. But what you also had is the other double bind that basically by being so influential in making these policies, it was hard for these lobbying groups then also to become particularly radical in demanding more and to demanding not just more monies, which is what they did, but also demanding radical political change.
Now, let's remind ourselves again for a moment only of the 1920s and 30s, the interwar years, where you had, again, already the beginnings of this fundamental transformation of agriculture, which actually went back already, started already before, but you had an acceleration of this process, certainly in the interwar years. But what you had in many European countries was this radicalization of agriculture to the left to some extent, but particularly to the right in many European countries with Nazi Germany as the most radical and most prominent example. And again, you had Poudagisme, for instance, in 1950s France, again, as a rather radical uh, political movement on what I would think, still think is the right, but that didn't turn as radical and as important also again for their being then in the long-term common agriculture policy. Now, so much on Emmanuel's questions, on Richard Hill's question, on trade, a uh, new col or still a colonial power. Um, again, as an academic, we probably would have to first discuss what with what we would mean precisely with colonialists. So I'm slightly hesitant to give you a quick yes or no answer. What I would think is that, again, in these trade negotiations, what we first have, and that is very interesting, is a European community that was turning into an international actor, that due to the trade mandate the European community had already early on in the Cold War, it was there, more than in most other policy fields, able to speak with one voice on many issues. And that gave it more an actor quality than other international organizations had, and that it also had in other policy fields. So in that sense, that probably is a first important starting point. Now, in agriculture, I would again argue that these protectionist impulses that had informed um, the CAP early on, and that had also led to this welfare dimension, continued to play a very prominent role for a long time, also because the United States, for complex reasons, which I will not explain now, um, was also not fully attacking the protectionist dimensions of the CAP and letting it go, basically, which led also to situations like the one in Switzerland, which, as we all know, was not a member state, but with its own agriculture policy, was always hiding between behind the bigger one of the European community. So there was also some kind of add-on effects of the kind of policy choices that the um, EC actually made. But what you also had then in the 1980s and 90s, particularly with the Uruguay round, um, is actually a liberalization of agricultural policy making, particularly in the GATT trade negotiations of the time. So in that sense, there was a certain liberalization of policy choices there. Um, but again, this also very much has to do with countries of the global north. And I would agree that, of course, the relations with the global south have become been more problematic. We all know that WTO trade negotiations are not have not been going well for quite some time. And particularly the common agricultural policy has remained a quite problematic force, particularly for producers in the global south. So if you want to lift this up to a more general level again, I would also argue that there is something that I would even call an autistic um, trade in ECEU policy making, i.e. that the perspective of actors from outside, from, for instance, countries in the global south, but also kind of more close by non-state members is often not very much factored in. Um, and that is probably also something that you can see in Brexit negotiations as we speak, that it is a rather EU self-centered perspective where one might be surprised that the EU is able to agree on something to, this, to, to the extent that it does, but where, again, the United Kingdom and policy actors in London, I think, continue to struggle to understand why their policy hopes and choices are not being considered more. My argument to explain this, and with this I'd like to end this, is that forging a consensus amongst an ever-growing growing number of member states has become so difficult and difficult enough that undoing that once you have such a consensus, which might already be part of what we then call in this EU jargon, the acquis communautaire, the EU law basically that you have, becomes too difficult, that you will not open that box because once you open that box with the acquis and again the agreement amongst the member states, the fear is that everything will fall apart. And that creates this level of autism, which therefore, if you talk about the EU in a nutshell, vis-a-vis -vis the wider world on all kinds of policy issues, might be um, um, a rather useful concept to explain EU policymaking, even if it's not coming from the field of history, but more from psychology, and therefore also has a slightly strange ring, probably, in policymaking discussions.
Thank you, Iran. So I have quite a few more questions uh, here, but I will cut them off at this point uh, to let you go. Uh, you've given us enough of your time, so apologies for the question askers who, who didn't uh, get to ask them. Apologies also for the technical glitch at the beginning, and thanks to you for uh, getting us past it, and thanks above all for your great presentation and uh, giving us some insight into your book, which I hope gets some uh, deserved publicity with this talk. The talk will also be available later on our YouTube channel, so Whoever wants to revisit it is welcome to do so on the Institute's YouTube channel. Um, I would also like to end this with a recommendation uh, of buying the book. It is probably a crowded field, but even so, I can't exactly think of any direct competitors that uh, deal with EU history so comprehensively and up to date. So uh, this this is, I think, um, a great starting point. I don't know if we should now call it uh, a definitive history. It certainly isn't because uh, the EU isn't finished yet. I, I take the book as a call to to lower our expectations in some ways of it, and and have them more realistic to to assess past successes, but also future crises and the extent to which they're able to undo everything that has been achieved. Um, all right, uh, I'll leave it with these fun words. Thank you so much, Kiran, for uh, giving us your time. Uh, thank you also to the participants of uh, being with us. And with this, I say goodbye and thank the speaker again. All right, bye. Thank you very much indeed to everybody and to you particularly, Mike.